Hardware to Save a Planet explores the technical innovations that are giving us hope in the fight against climate change. Each episode focuses on a specific climate challenge and explores an emerging physical technology solution with the person bringing it into reality. I'm your host, Dylan Garrett. Hello and welcome to Hardware to Save a Planet. I'm super excited for this conversation today with Dan White, the founder and CEO of Clean Crop Technologies. They're using a high voltage cold plasma to treat seeds and food to improve crop yields and reduce food waste. One of the things I keep learning about is how interlinked our food supply is with climate change. Our food systems are responsible for over a quarter of all greenhouse gas emissions. So food is a big contributor to rising temperatures. And at the same time, that rising heat is also one of the biggest threats to food production. So the combination of a growing population and rising temperatures is a recipe for the food insecurity we already see in the world worsening dramatically in the future. So what Clean Crop is doing is super important. To introduce Dan quickly, he has worked in agriculture for 20 years. He started on a fruit orchard in Pennsylvania, but spent most of his career in the Middle East, Southeast Asia, and Sub-Saharan Africa. I love that Dan is not an engineer and that he didn't start clean crop with a technology looking for a problem to solve. Instead, he identified a need in an industry he knew well and went looking for a solution. So Dan, it's an honor to have you. Thanks a lot for joining. Thanks, Dylan. Really excited to be here. So agriculture has been your career, a big part of your life, it seems like. I'm curious, how'd you get started in that space? Yeah, as you mentioned, I grew up in southern Pennsylvania in a town called Gettysburg, which most people know from the Civil War, there was a big battle there. But today, it's actually a really big agricultural area. So at the time I was growing up there, it was the sixth largest apple-growing county in the country. The first five are all in Washington state. And so a lot of my friends growing up, my parents weren't farmers, but a lot of my friends' parents were. And through them, started working for a family orchard in my teens and through college that sold everything from apples to peaches to berries in farmer's markets. It was kind of the beginning of the farmer's market boom on the East Coast. And uh, just really fell in love with agriculture in that process. It's probably still one of the most fun jobs I've ever had. But yeah, I wanted to get out of Pennsylvania. So basically look globally and tried to see where I could work in ag in other places. And that's taken me to a lot of different parts of the world over the last 20 years. Do you feel like your kind of perspective on climate change and agriculture and just the, what problems are important to be focused on was influenced really differently by all this global exposure than it would have been had you stayed in the U.S.? Yeah, I think definitely seeing how climate change is creating very different problems in different parts of the world was really illuminating. So in some of the parts of East Africa where I worked, one of the biggest challenges they're running into is just shifting rains. And when you're in a lot of these tropical and subtropical climates, uh, particularly with working with farmers without a lot of access to electricity or irrigation, the rain seasons are everything for the food security in those areas. And seeing how the impacts are different in places where those rains are getting more and more sparse, um, like has been happening in large parts of Kenya, versus other areas in Tanzania where the rains are getting more intense. And obviously it's varies year over year, but seeing how the biggest impact there is not really structurally one or the other. Over a 10-year period, they're probably experiencing not a huge difference in total rainfall, but it's the increased volatility. And I think that's really been the biggest thing and the most alarming thing to me when I look across the different parts of the food system where I've worked is, is yeah, the planet macro level is getting warmer, in theory, on paper, we're at more parts of the world where you could grow for longer, right? So there's all these studies looking at how there's now parts of Canada where you could be growing crops that 10 years ago by the temperature you wouldn't be able to. In some places, that's true. But in a lot of places, that's still not true because you have this increased frequency of these really extreme conditions, which uh, really outweigh a lot of the potential benefits from theoretical increase in like the temperate growing zones. And I think you see how that plays out differently in different parts of the world in a way that shows that the fundamental thing we need to be doing for our food system today, more than trying to mitigate the impact of agriculture on climate change, is recognizing that the die is cast. And the biggest thing we can be doing is trying to help growers find ways to buffer against those climate risks one way or the other. 
and help them provide some training wheels or some factors of safety on that production in a given year when they're going to see more drought, they're going to see more intensive rains, they're going to see heat spikes and cold snaps. All of these are part of climate change as experienced by growers. And really, from the technology and the innovation side, we need to be focused on ways to help blunt those particular extreme events if we're going to preserve and expand food production the way we need to. It's actually, it's probably a bit of both, but it sounds like you think of it as a climate change resiliency. What you're doing with Clean Crop is about improving our resilience to climate change. Yeah, our impact model definitely contemplates both things. So we've been working with a nonprofit partner to try to model out the greenhouse gas equivalent impact. And we definitely see through being able to keep more food structurally in the supply chain, where we're materially reducing what you could call the greenhouse gas footprint of the ag sector relative to the amount of food people consume. So if we can take a grower that today is losing 30% of their spinach yield and reduce that to 10% while holding their other inputs constant, their fertilizer, the water, the transport, we're getting more food into that supply chain without adding any more energy. So the efficiency of the system goes up in a way that makes it, reduces the greenhouse footprint, greenhouse gas footprint of that product. But from a sector standpoint, yeah, the resiliency is, and when we talk to growers, we talk to seed companies, the resiliency side of our treatment is really what's most urgently needed by them today based on what they're seeing on, in the farm. And so I think that's absolutely where we see the most traction with customers is on the ability to help them reduce exposure to these disease risks and to these other climactic risks. Okay. Yeah, let's get into that. What can you say more about the specific problem you were seeing? Because like I said in the intro, my understanding is you you didn't have a cold plasma machine looking for a problem to solve. What was right. it you were seeing specifically that motivated you to start Clean Crop? Yeah, so Clean Crop actually began, as you alluded to, from some of the work that I was doing overseas several years ago. I was working in Southern Africa and it was there about eight years ago, I met my co-founding partner, whose name's also Dan. His name's Dan Cavanaugh. At the time, he was a commercial manager for Cargill, doing a lot of their oil seed and grain trading programs at origination in the country. And he ended up getting tapped at one point to try to set up a peanut processing operation for another international conglomerate to try to find ways to take today, most peanuts that are grown in Mozambique and a lot of other emerging markets are just exported as raw commodities. So none of the value capture that comes out of that supply chain is retained in that country. So the idea was, could you, is there a way for you to set up a processing plant where farmers would be able to sell to that plant in country? That plant could add some primary value addition through making those nuts, sorting them, grading them, and then segmenting them so that you could keep more value in country before they're exported. And he led that effort and ultimately it failed because it kept running into this broad range of molds and toxins that you just couldn't deal with in the supply chain. And he and I had worked on a couple projects over the years and this problem became really urgent to us out of that challenge that he ran into. And so initially we were just looking for a technology that could address that one really narrow problem that he had, right? We wanted to find a machine that could make this business model work because everything else about it was great. We just couldn't control this one issue. So the thesis we developed was that if the problem that you have in supply chain in agriculture is that you are this sort of the center point of the hourglass. And so you can think about at your supply base, particularly in emerging markets, but even in the U.S. market, you've got hundreds or thousands of suppliers that are all commingling their product as it comes to you. And then you're processing it and selling it on eventually to thousands or hundreds of thousands or millions of consumers. And so when it comes to contaminants in that supply chain, you have what we used to call the 99 grower problem, which is 99 of your farmers can do everything right that you're buying from and their product's perfect. But that one farmer who either had bad luck that year or wasn't paying attention to their storage conditions gets a spike in mold, a spike in toxins. As soon as that stuff's commingled, your entire supply chain is compromised. And so our thesis was all these tools in field like herbicides and fungicides, promotion on farmer practices to try to mitigate these contaminants, all that stuff's great. But until you have a tool that can reliably turn back the clock on contamination once you find it in the supply chain that could safely remove it and keep that food in the human supply chain, you're not going to really move the dial on that supply chain food waste. That's really what set us out with a thesis to see if we could find what we call the offensive solution to food waste, which is not just a preventive measure, but actually can you take stuff that comes in with contamination on it and find a way to durably consistently and safely remove that without compromising the quality in the process. And over time, we spent a long time looking at different technologies. We looked at stuff like UV light and 
high pressure pasteurization and ozone. And everything had one challenge or another. And eventually we met a professor at Iowa State, read some of his papers, built some early prototypes off of them, who was a leader in using this cold plasma technology for addressing these food safety risks, addressing these food waste problems. And uh, we're really impressed by what we saw in the literature, did some early stage proof of concept work, and we started Clean Crop with him in, in 2019 to basically take those innovations to scale. If you were to go to all of the 99 or all of the 100 farmers supplying you and try to combat the contamination problem there, it's just the scale of the problem is too great and you'd be treating a bunch of places that don't have the problem. But what you're able to do is once you've aggregated all that supply into a central place is treat it there and avoid this issue of that one bad supplier who had a bad year contaminating the entire bunch. Yeah, that is where Clean Crop started. And we've ended up today actually going to market earlier in the supply chain. So we raised our seed round of capital to really build out our core technical team in 2020. And at the time, ran some early stage pilots around that original use case, looking at peanuts. And they were really successful, had great response from peanut processors we were talking to. And they basically said, look, come back when you guys are at 100x capacity. And so we've been heads down working on scaling up the hardware. But in the meantime, we said, okay, that's going to be great. It's going to be a ways down the road. We know just from our, the other areas we've worked in that there's similar problems at any point in the supply chain. Are there other applications where this technology is going to be at commercial scale earlier or today where we could start commercialization and really leverage that to drive the flywheel, to drive down costs, drive up scale over time. And so really we spent most of 2022 kicking the tires on a huge range of things. We looked at a lot of other nuts beyond peanuts. We looked at things like almonds and macadamias and pistachios. We looked at cocoa and coffee. We also looked at seeds. There was really interesting work looking at this huge issue of seedborne pathogens that drive that 30% of food that's lost in farmer field, even before it gets to the post-farm gate. And so we ran 38 field trials in 15 different crops in the seed space with customers and research partners in 2022, taking treated seeds all the way through full production, looking at impact on yields, impacts on infield disease incidents, really trying to find where are those entry points in this sector where it seems like we could generate value and had really good success out of those field pilots, had a, a wide range of crop categories, particularly in the vegetable seed space, where we were showing that we could really durably reduce disease pressure, both for seed companies and for growers, particularly on some disease categories that today they just don't really have good solutions for and made the decision to really narrow in on that market application based on the customer response that we got, which was to take that same problem set and say, look, we know that we're going to get to the point where we can go back and solve these supply chain issues post-farm gates. But for now, we've seen that there's a massive pain point for the seed suppliers that are going into that farmer field to begin with. And talking about leverage points in the same way that we saw that processing as a really critical leverage point in the food supply chain, the seeds are the highest impact leverage point you can have when it comes to infield disease incidents. Because all of those farmer blights that happen in their production fields, the primary entry point for that contaminant is the seed itself. You think about it, that seed is the thing that travels around the world the most. And so it happens to bring whatever was in that, was whatever diseases, molds, bacteria were in the field where it was grown, it will likely carry those over into the next field where it goes, unless you have some sort of control before that seed moves in there. And so that's really where we've ended up focusing Clean Crop's initial commercialization is around um, helping to act as a broad spectrum tool to reduce that infield farm production waste that is driven by seedborne pathogens. Okay, so that was a pivot, at least a temporary pivot, it sounds like, until you can get to the scale that where you could address the food issue as well. Yeah, our general sort of theory of the case on any hardware innovation is you're best off commercializing at as small a capacity as you possibly can to still generate positive unit economics. We've been really clear that we don't want to go to market before with a system that isn't able to generate contribution margin, that isn't able to demonstrate commercial viability. But once you're there, you're best off starting there because that then becomes a flywheel to just put reps on the machines, find the ways that it breaks, and work with your customers directly to help you give you that feedback. There's a lot of technology startups that, that I know and that I work with and have seen, there can be a real temptation to just hold back on real customer commercialization until you get that technology to a point that it's able to address a really compelling or the most compelling market size or other large area. 
I think there's just nothing that substitutes for forcing you as early as possible to build understanding of how your technology, the full life cycle on that tech. So not just how does the tech work in lab, but then how does that treated seed operate in your customer's operations? Getting your customer to give you feedback on what features they need, because you're going to be wrong on 80% of the features that actually matter to your customer. And so this, until you actually start getting that input from them. And so our philosophy was always, let's start where we find that supply demand curve can cross as close to the left as possible, so to speak, and then really lean into that for commercialization and then scale from there to progressively larger and larger markets. Yeah, that makes sense. You're making an impact earlier as a company. You're maturing your hardware probably faster because you're getting more feedback loops with your customers. And if the alternative is waiting to get to a scale where you can actually get that feedback through the other channels, that makes a lot of sense. How big of a problem is this? The I guess at both points, you've, I think you mentioned 30% food waste. Is that a combination? Is that the potential impact you could have by treating seeds and by treating the post-grown food? Yeah, these sort of macro numbers are use different build-up calculations. So the general estimation is that there's around 30% of all food is lost somewhere between the farm and the end consumer. So that's like the macro food waste number. We know for some crop categories, particularly those that we're focused on, some of these higher value vegetables and fruits that, are, that have just particular production dynamics, that 30% number is just in farmer fields. And so the total supply chain loss on those can be upwards of 50, 60%. So a crazy statistic I heard from the one of the produce associations is that more than half of lettuce that's grown in the U.S. is never consumed because it's lost to brown mold at some point in that supply chain. So about 30% of that is half of that is sort of in farmer fields, 30 to 50% is in farmer fields, and then the rest happens in the supply chain. And I know personally, I've been some part of that percentage. I don't know about you, but at some point you'll get a lettuce clamshell that just eventually is too far gone. And yeah, probably throw away somewhere between 20, 30% of those because those molds persist throughout that production system. And they enter those farmer fields largely through the seed. And so that 30% number is really the dial that we can move today on those crop categories we're addressing in farmer's field. But those same contaminants are the sort of, they enter the supply chain normally at the farm, and then they just manifest in that in uh, all along the rest of the supply chain. So we really see that high leverage point again to bend the curve on those total waste numbers starts at the farm. And that's where we want to begin. Got it. Yeah, I think I read that we're projected to need 70% more food than we produce today by 2050 to meet growing population demand. I just think that helps put these numbers into perspective. If you can take a big bite out of that 30% waste. Yeah, it's the lowest hanging fruit we have, right? Because no pun intended, because it's really where you can control all other inputs to the system can stay constant. You're just getting more out of it. And that's really how we look at the emissions of the sector is like for every gallon of water, for every acre of land, for every kilocalorie of energy, how much food are we getting out of that system? And today, there's just a macro inefficiency that sums out of these supply chains that we think if you can help processors, growers, again, going back to that idea of giving them tools to just buffer their operations, to add stability, to reduce risk. That's how you enable them to make all those micro decisions to just keep that food in the supply chain a little bit longer, keep that quality level up, make sure that that food lands on someone's plate before you have to get rid of it. And that's really, that's the sum of so many complicated decisions that everyone in each of these supply chains has to make, that the best way to move the dial on that is really just to build tools and let those growers, let those processors, let those seed companies find the best way to deploy them. I'm curious about the business model, and we can focus on the seed treatment, which you're going to market with first, is so are the big seed producers your customers? Yeah, it's a great question. So right now we've got two core segments that we're looking at. So I'm um, just at a high level because I don't think I went and described in detail earlier, but at a high level, what we do is we have a cold plasma system, as you mentioned, that basically you can think of as a reactor that generates a really intensive energy field. So you think of it the way I describe it in the simplest ways possible to my six-year-old, which I know is an oversimplification, but you can think about it like a swimming pool that's full of electrons. 
And whatever gas we push through that system is kind of jumping in that pool and it's picking up those extra electrons. And then it's ionizing, which just means it's then getting really excited, then recombining into all of these different reactive gas species that are looking for things to break down. And so what we do is have spent a lot of time figuring out ways to take that, that reactive gas mix and embody it in a machine that you can then really consistently deploy those gases to seeds in a way that you can tune them to preferentially break down those seedborne pathogens that are responsible for a lot of that waste, as well as other human safety risks like E. coli, salmonella, listeria, without harming the germination of the seed in the process. With that as the kind of core business model, there's really our two target or the core technology operation. There's two tar- really key target parts of the supply chain that need that service and experience that pain. The first, as you mentioned, is seed companies. So they will bring in seed from their suppliers all around the world who grow product literally just to strip out the seeds for them. And then they will process those seeds and sell them on to growers. So they hold all of the risk in terms of making sure that they don't end up sending broccoli seed or cauliflower seed or tomato seed to their growers that inadvertently introduces some blight into their growers field. So they definitely have an interest in technologies that can help them mitigate those pathogen risks at the processing phase. Just to interrupt you, is that an actual liability they have if there is a blight that's caused by their seeds? Are they, is that a real risk they carry? More reputationally, I think, okay. than anything else. It's a good question. There might be supply chain. Every supply chain I've found has totally different in ag. So it would not surprise me if there were arrangements out there where there was some sort of insurance risk, if there's a really well-known blight that could come in that they have to carry. But In general, yeah, if you're a grower and you bring something onto your field and there's a massive problem and you can identify that it came in on your seed, you're probably going to try to fight a different supplier next year. And so that's a big issue is really that market segments around crop health and and cleanliness. That's a big part of brand for a lot of companies. And then the other flip side to that risk, right, is on the grower side. So particularly if you're in an application where maybe you're not, you're growing a product that doesn't have It doesn't justify you buying the most premium seed where you're treating your seed as a commodity and you've got thin margins. You're going to have to go try to find the cheapest seed you can and it it likely comes with commensurate risk. And so we've seen a large segment of growers, particularly in closed loop systems, so like vertical farms, hydroponic greenhouses, sprouts production, where it's not just, oh, that row over there has a disease problem. It's, oh no, I've got to shut my whole production operation down We've got to clean everything out and bleach the gutters and do like there's an asymmetric impact of these contaminants entering those kinds of systems. And so that's where we've seen a lot of really strong response today from the grower side. But we're effectively offering the same product to them and the seed companies. It's just who in the supply chain wants to take on that product. Those growers saying, I'm not going to trust. It's too important to me. I can't trust that the seed company is going to give me totally clean seeds. I'm going to Right. Myself. And you also have just the general risk that accrues at any point in that chain of custody. So even when it comes into the seed processor, it looks good. It passes all of the lab tests. There's still a lot of touch points in that seed before it gets into that grower's operation. Mm-hmm. And so for them having one more interaction, one more opportunity to reduce their risk, it just provides peace of mind. It helps reduce their concerns because they can trace back to say, okay, I at least know that right before this seed was bagged, it was treated and was bagged aseptically by a company that is handling this to the highest possible standards. And that's really what we sell is we're saying, look, we're going to take your food safety risks, we're going to take your production risks really seriously. And so that's what we want to do. We want to reduce that risk and then we want to handle that seed after it's been treated in a way that is going to seriously reduce the chance that it gets recontaminated. And that's not always a given in this supply chain otherwise. And will you sell equipment or a service? So right now, we are commercially active today on a tolling service. So folks send us seed. We treat it at our headquarters in a tolling line and then package it aseptically and send it on to those growers for their production or seed companies for further processing. And so right now, that's all on a fee-for-service basis. Long term, our goal is to be able to drop this hardware into the processing line at the seed company or at the grower directly just to reduce the amount of travel, give them that optionality. But likely will be a a service based contract even in those situations, just because it seems like a lot of these companies are trying to move away from move assets off their balance sheet. 
and it gives them optionality to adopt and utilize on a recurring basis that allows them to flex up and flex down. And for us, still provides really compelling economics. So I think that's where it looked like we're going to be going for at least the next few years. But in the future, I think we'll be flexible depending on where the market wants to go. And are you replacing something? Or do they have other options to clean their seeds or is this a totally new step in the process? Yeah, Seed Health, it's an existing set of unit operations, particularly at a lot of the seed companies. But what that typically looks like today is that you'll have the main processing line at a big seed company, for example, where you'll have an, a fully automated, integrated line that's doing what we would call like mechanical sorting. So seed comes in, it might have some sticks and stones in the bag, has different sizes. There's some dead seeds and hollow seeds. Then it goes through gravity sorters, optical sorters, grading equipment that ends up with the final product on the end. But that seed is at that point graded, but it's not really sanitized. It's not cleaned. And so oftentimes that seed will have to go to a different part of the facility where it will ha- usually get either treated with hot water, meaning it'll get flash treated by a water treatment or some sort of chemical treatment like peroxide or other fungicides herbicides that go into that. And those operations tend to be very labor intensive. So oftentimes that seed's going to have to get touched five times in that process. And as you can imagine, it's got really tight tolerances. So if you're going to hydrate the seed to kill stuff, then you have to really quickly and really efficiently dry that seed back down so that it doesn't germinate. So you don't trigger those metabolic processes in the seed. And so that process is very expensive, has a lot of equipment. Oftentimes these operations will be in their own building with their own full-time staff. And so a large part of what is compelling to our customers is that we can replace those operations, maybe not fully today. We don't see ourselves as a silver bullet right now, but at least we can replace them as the first pass that you'll make. So our goal and where they're really interested in is our technology is a dry treatment. It's an automated treatment. And so it can live in that main processing line in a way that's really frictionless and doesn't require a lot of labor to get the same reductions in pathogen loads without having uh, any impact on germination in the process, which is the main downside to these existing technologies is you can kill anything, but can you kill it without harming the germination of the seed in the process? And that's where we see a big unlock in being able to be, look, you might still for some seed lots have to take it to your hot water, but if we can be the first pass on 100% of your stock, then it really reduces that operating cost to just those edge cases that are really dirty that you would still need those other equipment for. Got it. So it's not even, you're not adding cost to the process. You're actually potentially reducing cost of the process and improving the, the cleanliness. Yes. I want to talk about the hardware a little bit. I said this at the beginning too. I love that you're not a hardware engineer by background, but I'm guessing you're quickly becoming one <laughs> running a hardware yeah. company. <laughs> yeah. And actually, first, I was curious, I've read some of your posts on LinkedIn, and it's clear to me that you're really thoughtful about how you are building your team and your culture at Clean Crop. And knowing that both you and your partner don't have this kind of hardware technology background, I'm curious what you're doing to build a company to be able to do that. Like, how do you think about that problem? Yeah, it's been a huge part of what we think about a lot and a lot of hard lessons learned over the years. Being a non-technical founder of like a deeply technical startup has a lot of the pros and cons that you'd imagine. I think in a lot of ways, the net positive that it's had, obviously beyond just like us being able to have a lot more intuition around what our customers need, because we were those customers for a long time, has been more about being able to come in and both my co-founder and I try really hard, like we have no pretense when we're talking with our engineering team of that like we know more than them or that we have some intrinsic should have some intrinsic knowledge of the sector. And so we're really not afraid to ask just whatever dumb question comes into our head. And there's been a lot of times where that's actually translated into like pushing the team to think a lot about sort of conventional wisdom in a different way that's allowed us to move faster and I think harvest some opportunities. And I think the biggest thing that that has done for us is because we don't have any pretense around our own capabilities. From day one at Clean Crop, we've been really in consistent at trying to go out and assume that any problem we're going to try to solve, someone else in the world has probably tried to tackle this in the past. And we've done a really solid, we've made a, put a lot of effort into building sort of a, an ecosystem of advisors from university professors to other commercial partners and other technology experts who can just weigh in under a really thoughtful, collaborative, contracted structure that contemplate IP and ownership and all those things. But 
you can pretty weigh in in a really seamless and lightweight way to make sure that we're not spending time reinventing the wheel on anything. And I think that that building that culture from day one has yielded a ton of benefits for us in terms of leapfrogging problems that I think instinctively we would have tried to solve ourselves if we had the degrees to do so and has allowed us to really focus the team's efforts on just those problems that only we can solve. So it's really been leaning into where are those interfaces in different hardware subassemblies that we have to solve because we're putting two different things together that haven't been put together before. Where are there hardware stacks that with a little bit of effort, we can find someone that we can just buy this from, set up an exclusivity around that is as good as if we were to invent it ourselves. So that's been on the, the upside. I think on the downside, there's obviously, I think our engineers would likely point out those times where like that same approach hasn't worked out, right? I think there's been a lot of opportunity and like trying to develop some humility around like being open to recognizing that just because something seems simple from the outside, sometimes it is more simple than you think, but sometimes that's just the Dunning-Kruger effect. And it's been trying to really build a team where there's enough deep trust between us and them that when they really insist like, now nah, we really got to spend three months to work on this ourselves. That, like I trust my engineering directors to do that now. And I trust that they're building that that filtering function. But I think it's that that tension of like not coming in with too many priors has been mostly net positive as long as you have the humility and the awareness to recognize when you just might not know what you don't know. You mentioned kind of tapping this broader ecosystem of support. I'm curious how you've found that ecosystem to how helpful you found it to be. I mean, it sounds like you've found the right resources to work with, but I know you've been through a number of incubators and investors and things like that. And my perspective from the outside is that there is a growing community of kind of support companies, accelerators, investors that focus on hardware specifically. Do you feel as a hardware company that that ecosystem has been helpful? I think the thing that's been hard, and I think is that, I mean, we went through Mass Challenge, the accelerator in Boston, which was great and super helpful because it was so big and so varied. There was an ecosystem of people that we could kind of lean into and find on the menu who could be really helpful. But I think in general, and I think this is probably very different today, even than when we were starting out in 2019, 2020, so much of the startup ecosystem and like the general early stage generic advice is, has really come out of, is still has this holdover from the web 1.0, web 2.0 era, still very software focused. And I think that taking the implicit roadmap that came out of the unicorns and decacorns from these past decades on in software and trying to cross apply them to hardware, it just doesn't really work. And I think that it can both lead you to invest too much in under invest or under anticipate this massive chasm between finding product market fit and then being able to commercialize it. And I think that's really the sort of biggest disparity I see in a lot of the sort of generic ecosystem that isn't hardware specific has been that converting customer interest into revenue in software is not frictionless, but it's pretty close to frictionless. There's a whole playbook that's out there for companies who find that point. In hardware, that's really only when things begin to get difficult is... I think that's where we and many companies end up is that you end up with significant customer interest and you know what that is. And the challenge is being able to find what's the straightest path through this really murky process of going from early stage prototypes into a serial commercial production with predictable output volumes and the ability to turn those around as you sign purchase orders. And the dance between your sales team growth your sales cadence and your hardware deployment is really where things succeed or fail. And I think that the ecosystem around that has been really good. I found really good resources in terms of some early stage, like how do you go from your bench scale prototype to something a little bit bigger? How do you start to add automation and other features at that kind of zero to one phase? And then obviously established manufacturers, you have a really strong sort of network around. But companies like Synapse and others, there's not that many, but I think that there is a different point than this kind of life cycle sort of specialist support that is hard to find because you're still at the level where you need to be iterating really fast. You don't have capital to be iterating on a really complex external build every 30, 60 days, but you need to, to be able to maintain that, that pace of iteration. And I think that there's a lot of sort of detours and, and side quests that you have to go on 
in that hardware scale up process that today I still haven't seen effectively distilled into like a stylized guide generically for hardware startups, even though I think most of those problems are pretty generic. And it's something I would really love to see kind of evolve is like developing some more common nomenclature and language in our part of the startup ecosystem that could be the equivalent of what I would consider now is like a pretty established playbook for SaaS companies. And I think it's just, in our case, this last year has been such an, a humbling and incredible education in, all right, now we've got a prototype and it's meeting customer need. How do we have, let, let's go build a hundred of them. And then realizing that you've just kind of hit this whole new plateau of now having to go through this design for manufacturing cycle on that like managing investor expectations, managing your own expectations, managing your own cash burn against these multiple steps, like finding partners who can help you through that, who have seen that full life cycle of zero, not just to one, but to 10 to 100. It's hard to do. And I think it's an area that there's just an enormous need, particularly in climate tech. It's what every one of these climate tech companies really, really could benefit from, I think, that, that I'm aware of. Yeah, no, I think that's really well said. And yeah, we have to scale these things to have global impact. And I see so much focus on going from zero to one, but it can be just as hard, if not harder, to go from one to a hundred to a thousand. I just realized I don't have a great visual in my head. What do your systems look like? How big are they? Yeah, so right now our systems are smaller commercial scale, so about three feet by eight feet. And you feed seed into a hopper. It goes through a proprietary process where it's exposed to the plasma before it's been taken out for further processing. And so the key for us is really wanting to build that hardware so it's fully automated. Going to these seed companies, labor is currently a major problem. Going to be a labor shortage is going to be a huge problem moving forward, trying to automate some of these very manual processes today. And so for us, the key is seed has to come into the system dry, has to be able to get fed from a continuous flow a line going into it and then have a predictable outfeed on the other side so that it can be an easy retrofit into these automated processing lines. And then, yeah, everything inside is where the magic happens. What's your vision for clean crop looking into the future? Our vision is, you know, looking in these agricultural industries, you know, the kind of closest analog that we can look at is a decade ago, you went into those seed handling facilities, you go into food processing facilities, and you had these sorting operations that were, that did a pretty good job of like mechanically sorting out big stuff from small stuff, sticks and stones from seeds or nuts. But there wasn't really a good tool for sorting out blemishes or discolored stock. That was all a very manual process. And then it was sometime in like the late 80s, early 90s that you started to see optical sorting technologies begin at this nascent phase. And now you go into any sort of bulk handling facility in the food system today, and there's going to be an optical sorter that has a computer vision model that's driving it that's just a standard part of that process. And it didn't even exist as a unit operation decades ago. And our vision is that our technology is going to be the same thing for seed health, for food safety, for reducing these contaminants in supply chain as any processing line in nuts, grains, in seed handling around the world is just going to have one of our tools as part of that processing line, the same way that they have an optical sorting technology today and don't even think about it. It's just, it has to be there. It's part of the standard operation and just make everything more efficient. And to do that in a way where what we're able to do is replace these thermal treatments that today are mostly supplied by natural gas, these chemical treatments that have all sorts of environmental externalities on soil health, and replace them with a purely electric-driven solution. Electricity is our primary feedstock in our operation. That's really the goal. Okay, cool. So I have three last questions for you that I ask every guest. The first is how optimistic or pessimistic are you about the future of the planet and why? Yeah, it varies day to day, obviously. But <laughs> I think those days when I'm feeling most optimistic, it's Largely because I feel like when you look at things like solar adoption rates or the cost of solar power or adoption of electric vehicles, like we haven't just met those forecasts. We've, in many cases, beaten them by orders of magnitude. And I think the thing that makes me most optimistic about the overall future is that we're just as humans terrible at actually being able to wrap our heads around the, how quickly and how fundamentally society can change, both for the good and for the bad. I think as long as we're putting our effort towards really bending the curve as much as we can on these technologies that we really need to make sure that we're able to make this energy transition, then I think in a lot of ways, we're going to be pleasantly surprised by how quickly that happens and how a lot of the things that seem hardest today are going to end up being not the things that are the most challenging. 
who is another company or individual doing something to address climate change that's inspiring you? I think one in the ag space that I really love is a company called iGen out of Washington State. Kenny Lee and Rich Warden are the co-founders there. They've developed a really incredible looking solar powered weeding robot that really displaces the need for broad spectrum herbicides in crop production with a very low cost, uh, lease based solution for growers. And just the pace that they've been able to build that product over the past few years, having watched their progress, has just been astounding to see how quickly they've pulled that together. And it's one of those examples of a tool that I has really beat all expectations in terms of how quickly we can build something and how quickly farmers will adopt it. I think that's just been like an incredible story to watch. Nice. What advice do you have for someone not working in climate today who wants to do something to help? Yeah, it gets back to one of those core tenants that we have at Clean Crop of always asking first, has someone else solved this or what else has been done in the world? Like we're a collaborative species. And so my advice is always like, If you're really worried about something or if you think there's an area you want to jump into, just reach out to people building in that space. Reach out to people who have worked there and spend as much time as you can just asking questions, even if they sound dumb, teaching yourself through those conversations. If you want to jump into a new field in climate tech, there's no better way to do that. It's an incredibly welcoming ecosystem. The general culture is is one where if you're excited about something and you reach out, there's a good chance that founder is going to be willing to take some time to talk to you about it. And yeah, get to the point where once you have had those conversations and you feel like you already knew everything that that person's telling you, like that's when you can really start to think hard about next steps. But I just say really lean into learning everything you can. Awesome. Yeah, I've found the community to be really open and collaborative like that too. Cool. Well, Dan, that was fun. I love what you're doing. I love your story. Thanks a lot for your time. Yeah, thanks, Dylan. It was really great to be here. Hardware to Save a Planet is brought to you by Synapse. To find out more about us and how we develop hardware solutions for the world's most ambitious companies, head to synapse.com. And then make sure to search for Hardware to Save a Planet in Apple Podcasts, Spotify, and Google Podcasts, or anywhere you like to listen. Make sure to click subscribe so you don't miss any future episodes. On behalf of the team here at Synapse, thanks for listening.